Hello students, welcome to lecture 3 of the online course on Photonic Crystals, Fundamentals and Applications. Today's lecture will be covering the fundamentals of electromagnetic theory of light. So, this lecture provides a detailed introduction of the electromagnetic theory of light and we will see how the classical Maxwell's equations are valid for wave optics. So, here is the lecture outline, a brief overview of uh, electromagnetic optics, we will discuss about divergence, curl and gradient operations. We will also discuss about Gauss theorem and Stokes theorems, then the constitutive relations which will help us describe light matter interaction and then we will go into Maxwell's equations and discuss all the four Maxwell's equations. So, here is a photograph of uh, James Clerk Maxwell. So, he formulated a set of fundamental equations of enormous importance that bear his name. So, with the use of Maxwell's equation, you can actually describe light as an electromagnetic wave and we can actually see later on that this electromagnetic optics actually describes lot more physical phenomena than wave optics and ray optics. So, electromagnetic optics, so it is basically a vector theory comprising an electric field and a magnetic field that vary in time and space. So, in electromagnetic optics, light is basically a uh, mix of electric field and magnetic field. So, wave optics is basically an approximation to this electromagnetic optics that relies on the wave function. So, it is basically a scalar function of time and space. Okay? And when we talk about ray optics, it is basically the limit of wave optics when the wavelength is very short. So, in short, you can say that electromagnetic optics encompasses wave optics, which in turn reduces to ray optics in the limit of short wavelengths. So, wave optics has a far greater reach than ray optics. Remarkably, both approaches provide similar results for many simple optical phenomena involving paraxial waves such as focusing of light by lens and a behavior of light in graded index media and periodic systems. But wave optics offers something that ray optics cannot. It is like the ability to explain phenomena such as interference and diffraction. So, for explaining interference and diffraction, you have to use wave optics, ray optics will not be sufficient there. However, wave optics is also unable to uh, quantitatively account for some simple observations in optics experiment such as division of light at a beam splitter. Now, at a the refraction of light that is reflected and transmitted turns out to be dependent on the polarization of the incident light, which means the light must be treated as a you know vector rather than in the context of scalar theory and that is where electromagnetic optics enters the picture. Okay? So, that is how you can see that electromagnetic optics can explain much more things than wave optics and ray optics alone. Now, in common with radio waves and x-rays, light is also an electromagnetic phenomena that is described by vector wave theory. So, optical frequencies, they basically occupy a band in this electromagnetic spectrum that extends from uh, far infrared okay, to visible to ultraviolet. So, this is basically the range of uh, wavelengths. So, if you talk in terms of uh, the range of optical wavelengths, you can talk in terms of 10 nanometer to 300 micrometer. And in that vast range, you can see this is a very small region which is marked by say 300 nanometer to 700 nanometer. That basically tells us about the visible range because we humans can see that only particular those frequency range or the wavelength range. Okay? So, electromagnetic radiation propagates in the form of two mutually coupled vector waves which are electric field wave and magnetic field wave. So, they are basically coupled to each other and that is how electromagnetic radiation propagates. Now, before proceeding to Maxwell's equation for electromagnetics, 
we need to go through some important operators used in vector calculus and these operators used widely in the calculation of electromagnetic phenomena and these are nothing but gradient, divergence and curl. So, gradient basically tells you about change in magnitude of a scalar field, divergence tells you about the source of vector field and curl tells you about the rotation of a vector field. So, here you can actually, actually see that these basic operations allow extracting information about the distribution of electromagnetic field, energy associated with the field and electromagnetic radiation and so on. So, here you can see that say there is po some positive charge here and there are more positive charges here. So, the gradient is in this particular direction. Similarly, it is more negative here and then it is less negative here. So, the gradient is in this direction. So, if you take gradient of a scalar field, you actually see a vector. Now, this is divergence. Okay? So, if you take divergence of a vector field, you basically get a scalar. And if you take the curl of a vector field, you again get a vector. So, we will get into this uh, in more details in the next slides. So, the four Maxwell's equation that are useful for describing an electromagnetic wave are basically written in the vector calculus notation. That is why it is very important to understand these three basic uh, operators of vector calculus that is gradient, curl and divergence. So, in the differential form of uh, Maxwell's equation, you will see that the equations are written in the form of uh, vector differential operator nabla okay? or it is also called as del. Okay? So, in 3D space, the vectors can be split into orthogonal components and the partial derivatives can be calculated accordingly uh, for each uh, directional component. And this uh, nabla or del operator is basically a vector differential operator which can be written as this. So, this is del, it is basically dot o x i cap plus dot o y j cap plus dot o z k cap. So, then the next operator useful operator is Laplacian operator which is nothing but you know nabla squared. Okay? So, nabla that is del operator is also used in Laplacian operator and it is sometimes called uh, nabla squared or del squared. So, this is basically showing double differentiation, right? So, if you can also write it as del dot del, okay, you can write them in the vector form, bold face, okay, it, it turns out to be del square, which is basically multiplying this dot product with the same thing. So, you will get do x, do square do x square plus do square do y square plus do square do z square. So, this is basically double differentiation. Okay? Now, let us look into the gradient in more details. So, a scalar field a scalar field's gradient is basically a vector field whose magnitude represents the rate of change and which points in the general direction of the scalar field's greatest rate of increase. So, here you can see as discussed that so there is some positive charge here say and then there are more charges over here. So, this is the way the gradient will be showing. Okay? Similarly, there is negative charge here and then more negative charges here. So, this is how okay, it is the gradient in this particular direction. So, now if delta is made to operate on scalar field, say F is a scalar field here. Okay? So, when you want to take the gradient of that uh, scalar field, what you will get is a vector. So, it is represented like this in Cartesian coordinate system. You can write gradient of uh, field F. Okay? So, F is a scalar field. Okay? So, you can write grad F or like this del F directly. So, del F will be nothing but this that is the del and then you have F. Okay? So, you can actually write i do f do x plus j cap that is do f do y plus k cap do f do z. So, f is nothing but a scalar field, but then when you take the gradient, this becomes a vector. So, that is why it is written here, you see, gradient of a scalar field gives you vector. 
next important one is divergence of a vector okay so divergence quantifies the magnitude only not the direction okay of the amount of vector field that flows out or into a specific region in other words the divergence calculates the amount of source or sink for a given field okay so if this is like electric field lines electric field lines originate from a positive charge so you if you see that you know the fields are coming out it means there is a positive charge over there and if you see that the fields are going in it means there is a sink over there that means a negative charge is over there okay so how do you calculate this so if del is made to operate on a vector function f so here electric field or any other vector field okay so you can actually see this is a bold phase f okay so you can calculate this as a dot product with your del operator so divergence of f is nothing but you know del dot the vector field f f also now will have three components fx fy and fz so you can write del dot f equals do fx do x plus do fy do y plus do fz do z so it tells you that what you get is a scalar okay so divergence of a vector field gives you a scalar the next important parameter is curl okay it's not parameter it's basically an operator okay it's curl so the calculation of curl quantifies the amount and direction of rotation of a vector field okay so the curl is always uh, associated with the amount and direction of rotation okay so with the result being a vector perpendicular to the plane of the rotation so this is similar to a sense when a pseudo vector is used to represent rotation in physics okay so if there is a charge coming out okay so you can see that if there is a um, field that is vector field that is coming out okay if you take the curl it will be like this in this direction okay and if the, the vector field is going in the curl will be in the clockwise direction okay so you can calculate curl so curl of a vector field f will be nothing but the cross product okay so when you take this is a vector this is a vector you take the cross product and this is what you get you get a vector so curl of a vector field also gives you a vector okay so curl of f will be nothing but i cap do fz do y minus do fy do z plus j cap do fx do z minus do fz do x plus k cap do fy do x minus do fx do x so this is simply a cross product of you know del and f these two vector fields clear so with that we can now move on to discuss the gauss theorem or the divergence theorem which will be also useful in understanding you know maxwell's equation so this particular theorem states that the flux of a vector quantity outward through a closed surface s so this is a closed surface s okay so this is the flux that is coming outward is basically equal to the integral of the divergence of that function in the enclosed volume v so graphically you can see here so if you think of calculating the flux that comes out of the surface of this particular enclosed uh, volume okay so you can actually take f and then a cap is basically the normal of the surface and you integrate it over all the closed surfaces that will be same as taking the divergence of this field f and then integrate it over the volume so how do you interpret this result so if the given volume does not contain a source or a sink okay so what do you expect then the net flux through that volume must be zero it means whatever will enter must also exist okay so the net flux will be zero and it is possible to find such volume that will entrap an electric charge because an electric charge represents an electric monopole so it is also possible to have you know only lines coming out of this okay if there is a positive charge over here 
or you can also have only a negative charge so in that case electric field lines will only enter this particular surface so you can actually have monopoles electric monopoles and this this these observations will lead to the first equation of maxwell okay now if you consider the same thing for magnetic uh, monopoles that is not the case okay so for magnets uh, magnetic field you will see that it is not possible to find a volume which entraps a magnetic charge that means you know you have to always have you know uh, north and south pole together it means there are no magnetic monopoles and that is why you can say that the magnetic field is basically divergence less okay so whatever enters this volume will be exiting the volume so there will be no divergence so this leads to maxwell's second equation we then look into stokes theorem so stokes theorem it basically relates the surface integral of the curl of a vector to the line integral of the vector itself so if uh, the stokes theorem basically states that the surface integral of the curl of the vector field over an open surface s will be equal to the closed line integral of the vector along the contour and closing that open surface so you can see this one so it's like summation of all these curls will be equal to the summation of this particular line integral okay closed line integral so you can actually write it like this so say you have curl of a vector f and uh, that is there over this entire surface okay so and a is basically a vector which is normal to the surface so this will be equal to a closed line integral of the vector along the surface so in other words the circulation of a vector around a given boundary is equal to the net curl over the whole surface of the patch limited by that boundary next we come to um, constitutive relations so in order to apply maxwell's macroscopic equation it is necessary to specify the relationship between the displacement field d and uh, electric field e as well as the magnetic uh, magnetic field h and the magnetic flux density that is b so equivalently we have to specify the dependence of polarization okay so that is p hmm. and there we'll have this bound current on the applied electric and magnetic field so this equation specifying this range uh, response are called the constitutive relations so now first we'll talk about the dielectric permittivity which is basically defined as a ratio of uh, the electric field within a material and the corresponding electric displacement so d is basically written as epsilon not e right so what happens when um, no so epsilon not is basically the vacuum uh, permittivity so if you have a non polarized material without any electric field so here any electric there is no electric field so all these atoms are basically unpolarized and you can see the electron cloud dancing around the nucleus okay so there is no displacement as well but as long as you as soon as you uh, put this material under the influence of electric field vector like this what happens there's atom atomic elements get polarized because the electron cloud moves away uh, from the nucleus okay in the direction opposite of the electric field and that will create a kind of charge separation uh, of this bound charges and they basically work like dipoles and this is the polarization that is happening in this particular material so the material becomes electrically polarized okay so in that case um, you can basically um, explain the amount of polarization okay which is proportional to the electric field so more the amount of electric field you apply the charge separation will be larger 
So, the electric field and the electric displacement and electric polarization, all of this can be related by this particular equation, where d can be written as epsilon naught e plus p. Okay? So, this p is nothing but epsilon minus epsilon naught e. So, when you put that here, you can actually get that um, d equals epsilon e. So, this epsilon is basically the permittivity of this material. Now, when exposed to an external um, magnetic field, the collection of individual magnetic dipole moments within most materials will also attempt to reorient themselves in the direction of the field. So, this will generate an induced magnetism or you can say magnetization. Okay? So, this will contribute to the net magnetic flux density inside the material. So, in that case, you can write B, which is the magnetic flux density as nothing but mu naught H, mu naught is a vacuum permeability and H is the magnetic field strength plus mu naught M. So, this is the magnetization. Okay? So, when you do that together, you write mu H. Now, uh, the degree in which um, the induced magnetization impacts the magnetic flux density depends on the material's magnetic permeability that is mu. So, what is mu? Mu magnetic permeability is basically the ratio of the magnetic flux density B within a material and the intensity of the applied magnetic field H okay, provided the fields are sufficiently weak and that is typically the case. Okay? Now, if you consider a material which is non-magnetic, so there magnetization cannot take place. So, you can write m equals 0. In that case, your B will be simply mu naught h. So, here in this particular course, we will be mostly dealing with that kind of material which falls in this particular category of m equals 0. Okay? Now, with that, understanding of constitutive relations. Now, let us go and look into the Maxwell's equation. Now, Maxwell's equation, so there an electromagnetic field is basically described by two related vector fields which are functions of position and time. So, you have electric field E as function of R and T. You also have a magnetic field H which is function of R and T. Now, after the myriad of researches Okay, carried out for fundamental reasons behind the origin or source of electromagnetic field and the relationship between electric and magnetic fields by pioneer scientists like uh, Ampere, Coulomb, uh, Faraday and Gauss. Finally, the revolution happened when James Clerk Maxwell proposed a set of these fundamental equations in 1865 which are used to describe the electromagnetic properties of light. So, Maxwell's equation, these are basically collection of Gauss law, Faraday's law and Ampere's law, but then put them together, they are Maxwell's equation. Okay? So, in general, there are six scalar functions of position and time required to describe an electromagnetic field um, in a medium. And fortunately, these six functions are interrelated such that they satisfy the celebrated set of coupled partial differential equations which are known, and, known as uh, Maxwell's equation. So, this is the first equation which says uh, del dot E equals rho V over epsilon. So, that is the Gauss law, of Gauss law and uh, del dot H equals 0 is basically the Gauss law for magnetism. Okay? Carl of E equals minus uh, mu uh, dou H dot T or you can simply write minus dou B dot E that is uh, Faraday's law and Carl of H equals J plus epsilon dou E dot T that is also can be written as dou D capital D dot T. So, that is Ampere's law. Okay? So, here you can see that epsilon and E can be combined together in the form of D that is the electric flux density. So, there are six important parameters here. So, E is the electric field vector, H is the magnetic field vector, 
D is the electric flux density, B is magnetic flux density, rho is charge density and J is current density. So, these are the important parameters okay? and uh, as discussed that these are basically four laws derived by Gauss, Ma Faraday and Ampere, but when you put them together to describe electromagnetic field that is the Maxwell's equation. So, let us look into these equations one by one. The first one is Gauss law for electric field. So, here you can say that while the area integral of the electric field okay, um, gives a measure of the net charge enclosed. So, this is the area integral of the electric field okay, is giving you about the net charge enclosed. So, this is the Maxwell's equation in uh, so you can uh, integral form. So, you can write the net charge is Q, okay, that is nothing but the charge density integrated over the volume. Okay. In differential form, it looks pretty neat. Um, so, you can simply write del dot D equals rho V, okay. that is the charge density. Okay. Similarly, Maxwell, uh, Gauss law for magnetism. So, there the net flux is always 0 for dipole sources. So, you can see that B dot D s over a closed surface is 0 that means the flux that is entering is also exiting and this is possible because there is no monopole in magnetism right. So, there is no magnetic monopole and that is why the flux that will be entering will also leave that particular closed surface. In differential form it looks like this so it is del dot b equals 0. Now, Faraday's law tells us that the line integral of the electric field around a closed loop is equal to the negative rate of change of the magnetic flux okay, through the area enclosed by that loop. Okay. So, in differential form this can be written as curl of E equals minus dou B dot T. E, okay. So, this is also the electromotive force that uh, is described in this particular form. But this differential form tells us that whenever you have a time varying you know magnetic field okay, you will have a rotation in the electric field vector. Similarly, when you look into Ampere Maxwell equation, so this gives that the total magnetic force around a circuit in terms of the current through the circuit plus varying electric field through the circuit that is basically the displacement current. So, I t in integral form can be written as closed line integral of H t d L okay, and that can be written as okay, surface integral of the displacement current plus the rate of change of the displacement electric field or the varying electric field okay, and then you take the surface integral of it. So, differential equation or differential form is much more simpler. So, you can write as curl of H is J plus dot D dot T. Okay. It means if you have a current flowing, so you will have a magnetic field okay, which is rotating okay, and then that also equates to the time varying electric field. So, this two together will give you the rotation of the magnetic field. So, a brief description of the Gauss law, the first one, okay, the law was published uh, posthumously in 1867 as part of collection of work by the famous German mathematician Gauss okay, and uh, this particular one del dot D equals rho f. Okay, these are different notations, but it stands for the free charge density. Okay. So, this is the Gauss law for electromagnetism. Now, we can suppose that you know S is a closed area which has got a charge Q at the center. Okay. So, you can actually write that the electric field that is coming out, okay, N cap is basically the normal vector to this closed surface. Okay. When you do this integration, you get Q 
q over epsilon naught. So, Gauss law tells us that the flux of the electric field through S is basically total charge enclosed divided by the permittivity. So, this is the total you know flux that you are getting. Now, in the differential form you can obtain by using the divergence theorem. So, instead of this particular surface integral you can convert this into a divergence and then volume integral right and q by epsilon naught can be written as volume integral of rho dv by epsilon naught. So, when you take instead of this left hand side if you take this as the left hand side and instead of this right hand side in the previous equation if you take this as the right hand side. So, this is how you can put them together ok. So, it is like the volume integral of the divergence of E will be equal to the volume integral of rho by epsilon naught. So, you can actually take this quantities and equate them together. So, you get divergence of E equals rho by epsilon naught ok. So, this is how you can write this particular equation. You can take epsilon naught and multiply it to E and you can write that also as D fine. So, let us look into the Gauss law of magnetic field. So, Gauss law for magnetism states that no magnetic monopole exists and therefore, the total flux through a closed surface must be 0 ok. So, you can actually see that any surface the amount of you know flux that is entering and exiting will be equal because if you start cutting a magnet into half each of those half magnets will also have the two poles ok. So, divergence of B equals 0 can be actually derived from surface integral of B equals 0. Now, the third equation is coming from Faraday's law of in induction right. So, this is one of the first two equations that connect E and B ok. So, that is very interesting because here you are actually getting uh, a relationship between um, magnetic flux density and electric field. And in the last equation, the fourth equation, you will get the relationship between magnetic field and electric flux density. So, let us look into the first one here. So, the electromagnetic induction was discovered independently by Michael Faraday in uh, 1931 and Joseph Henry in 1932 but uh, Faraday published his uh, results first and so the law is known as Faraday's law of induction right. So, here it says that line integral of an electric field around a closed loop is equal to the negative rate of change of the magnetic flux through that area and closed by the loop. So, you can actually take a make a loop like this and take a magnet through this one ok and you can see that with the direction you know, when you go this way the galvanometer shows the positive current if you take it away it shows the negative current and so on ok. So, there is this negative sign coming into picture. So, you can also see that you know this integral form tells us about couple of interesting things that you can take induced electric vector field and then take a closed loop line integral ok, where d l stands for a very small length of that closed path. So, what you get is nothing but minus dot dot t ok, that is the rate of change of the magnetic flux density through that closed surface. So, you do b dot n cap, n cap is the unit vector which is normal to the surface and this is how you obtain this ok. So, you can use um, you can try to see um, the magnet Faraday's law of induction in uh, differential form. So, here the physical meaning remains same it says that you know the changing magnetic field produces a circulating electric field. So, this curl of E means it is a circulating electric field ok and uh, dou b dot T e means changing magnetic field with time. When I say changing magnetic field is basically changing with time. So, you can start with this equation that uh, over a closed circuit E dot d l ok and then you can use the Stokes theorem and write that you know 
this is equal to curl of E ds ok. So, you can write curl of E ds over surface integral which is same as minus dA dt b dot ds integral over that closed surface ok. So, from this you can equate these two and say this quantity curl of E is basically equal to minus tau b dot E ok. So, this is how you can obtain the differential form. Now, <coughs> coming to the fourth equation where actually Maxwell made a very important contribution. So, before Maxwell the world only knew that half of this equation and uh, this half of the equation was known as Ampere's law ok. And what is that law? It says that you know a electric current going through the wire turns this current turns this uh, wire into a magnet because when the current flows a magnetic field will be generated right. And the direction of the magnetic field is obtained by a right hand rule. So, where the thumb will uh, go in the direction of the current flow and the fingers basically uh, tell you about the direction of the rotating magnetic field. So, Ampere had shown how to make magnetism from electricity right. So, right hand thumb rule also works well here. So, Ampere's law when there is no time dependence ok, it, it basically becomes byard savart law you can directly write it from this particular byard savart law that b dot d l ok. So, this is b ok. So, and d l is a very small path in this uh, closed loop. So, when you do the integration you get mu naught i over 2 pi r ok. So, finally, you can write that b dot d l closed loop integral is nothing but the current enclosed mu naught i ok. Now, we can put b equals mu naught h in this integral form of uh, Ampere's law ok. That is uh, cyclic integral of or you can say closed loop integral of uh, b dot d l equals mu naught i ok. And then the differential form of Ampere's law can be determined by using the Stokes theorem. So, you can say that you know mu naught can be adjusted here and you can write uh, h dot d l is nothing but i enclosed and uh, closed loop integral of h dot d l can be written as curl of h into a surface integral right and current enclosed can be written as surface integral of the current surface current density right. So, these two can be equated and you can simply write curl of h is nothing but current density ok surface current density. So, curl of h becomes j. So, this is the Ampere's law without any time dependence. So, this is incomplete and it is not valid for electrodynamics. This is good for electrostatics, but not electrodynamics. So, now this is where you know Maxwell's law goes uh, sorry Ampere's law goes wrong and incomplete and where Maxwell actually made his contribution to this Ampere's law by bringing in the time dependence. So, when Maxwell wrote down Ampere's law he found that something is incomplete. So, how do you see that? You can take divergence of the Ampere's law. So, Ampere's law is simply curl of h equals j. So, you take divergence of it. So, you get divergence of j. Now, divergence of a curl is always 0. So, does it mean that divergence of j is also always 0? But that is not the case always right. Current uh, electric currents obey the continuity equation and you have seen that you know do rho dot t e equals minus um, divergence of j. It means mathematically the curl of h should have something more than just this j ok. So, Maxwell knew that a time varying magnetic field gives rise to a solenoidal electric field which is the Faraday's law. 
So, why not a time varying uh, D field okay, give rise to a solenoidal H field? So, that is possible. So, that way the universe loves symmetry. So, Maxwell introduced this term as displacement current density which is J D that is nothing but dot D over dot T. So, he introduced this term in the Ampere's law and this equation is modified as Ampere Maxwell's equation right and this is what is required for electrodynamics. So, the fourth Maxwell's equation now states that the generation of magnetic field can be done in two methods. So, you can apply a surface current or electric current and you can also have changing electric field. So, that makes you know the Max Ampere Maxwell equation complete. So, a flowing current J gives rise to a magnetic field that circles the current. So, that is pure Ampere's law and a time varying electric flux density D gives rise to a magnetic field that circles the D field. Okay? So, that is the Maxwell's contribution. So, you can now write this as curl of H equals J plus J D where J D is nothing but dot D dot T. So, you can write it in terms of you know this is the relationship between a electric flux density and magnetic field. Okay? So, we can now summarize the Maxwell's equation in terms of uh, static and dynamic fields where electric and magnetic fields are independent of each other in the case of electrostatics whereas they are coupled to each other in the case of electrodynamics. Okay? So, you can see the magnetic uh, the equations in integral form over here. So, the first equation remains same, second equation is where you bring in the time varying magnetic flux density. Okay? Similarly, in the fourth equation you also incorporate this new term. So, the new terms are shown in blue. If you want to remember only the differential form, you can say that del dot d equals rho v that remains same for electrostatic and electrodynamics, but curl of E equals 0, but curl of E is minus dou b dot E in case of electrodynamics. So, a time varying um, magnetic flux density gives rise to a rotating electric field. Right? Similarly, the Gauss law for magnetism that remains same, but then the Ampere's law is cor corrected as Ampere's Maxwell's equation, okay, where this new term in blue is introduced. Right? So, you can actually see the differences in the time varying case as compared to the static case which are basically highlighted in this blue color. So, with that we will come to an end to this basic discussion. So, thank you everyone. In case you have got any doubt regarding this lecture, you can always drop an email to me at this email address mentioning MOOC and photonic crystal on the subject line. Thank you. Thank you.